This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome to the How to Run for Office podcast from My Campaign Coach. Thank you all for downloading this week's episode. As I mentioned in last week's podcast, here in year two of the How to Run for Office podcast, we're changing things up a bit, and I'm alternating between our standard interview format and deeper dives into specific subjects. I think this is going to be a great way to take a more in-depth look at some of the common coaching problems that I see when I'm working with campaigns, while still keeping a heavy focus on the interviews that you've gotten used to over the last year. That said, you all have veto power over this change up. I want to make sure that we're delivering valuable information to help you win elections. And if you have input, advice, or criticism, I want to hear about it. So shoot me an email to raz, it's R-A-Z, at mycampaigncoach.com and let me know what you think. Heck, even if you think it's a great idea, give me a shout, let me know what you think of the podcast, and I look forward to connecting with you. One of my favorite parts about working in politics is the awesome people that I get to work alongside. Our guest this week is somebody I've worked with for several years, and it's awesome seeing the impact that he's having right now in the Texas State House. Micah Cavanaugh is a native of Kentucky, but he calls New Braunfels, Texas home at the moment. He became passionate about politics at an early age and has consistently worked to further conservative causes, regardless of the state that he's hailing from. Micah spent a couple years working for one of our previous guests, Luke Macias, helping elect strong conservatives across our state, and he now serves as Chief of Staff to Texas State Rep Tony Tindrell. Now, Mike is supposed to help me be getting on his boss here sometime soon, so we'll, we'll kind of judge him after the fact by how quickly Tony comes on here, but hopefully that will not be too far in the future. When he's not helping elect conservatives or kill bad legislation in the Texas House, Micah spends a lot of time volunteering on international mission trips, helping spread the gospel to children in places like Russia, Colombia, and Ecuador. Today, we're going to be learning more about his experiences, how he ended up moving from activist to paid work on campaigns, and many of the lessons he's learned on the campaign trail, as well as in his work as a legislative staffer. Micah, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Raz. Appreciate you having me on, and uh, now I have a little more of an incentive to get my boss on here in the near future, so appreciate <laughs> that as well. You know, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of public shaming, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get him on here soon, hopefully have a wonderful time with him. He's He's a combat veteran. He's a rock star on the Texas State House, and I'm excited to get some of the wisdom from him to share with these candidates and staffers that are downloading every week. Absolutely. Well, again, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Well, you're somebody that spent a lot of time in the trenches on both the legislative staff side and the campaign side. And so I really want to kind of draw some of that information, kind of take that knowledge that you wish that every candidate and every staffer had that you picked up along the way in all these battles you fought and make sure that our listeners get access to it. And I want to kick us off kind of the same we do every week, every interview, by just having you give us a little bit of background about yourself, kind of how you got involved in politics, your background, and the route that brought you around to working full-time in politics here in Texas. Sure. Well, you know, I grew up um, in a small uh, town, and I grew up uh, in a family that my dad was a pastor, so I was a PK growing up. And my parents were, they weren't politically they weren't political activists, but they were active locally in what was going on. Like they knew who was elected and everything and really got to blame it on them as to how I got involved in politics. My mom made me go down to the local Republican Party headquarters uh, at the age of 12 and was like, you're going to get involved and you're going to know what's going on <laughs> and you're going to you're going to volunteer. And I was like, OK. So I went and uh, I was a willing participant and uh, got to meet all the local Republican ladies who worked down there. And they were excited to have somebody young, you know, and interested at that age. And so I would lick stamps and put up signs for local candidates. And by the age of 12 or 13, I knew everybody who was locally elected in my town, which is probably unusual for that age. That was kind of how I got my intro into politics, uh, if you will, was just that mom and dad saying, hey, you need to get involved. <laughs> I love it. Well, you and I have a very similar story when it comes to that kind of thing, because I started knocking doors for a friend of my parents who's run for state rep at 10 years old. And yeah. we, we, so I, I was a preacher's kid. So we've had a lot in common that we've shared over the years, kind of as far as how we got initially engaged in politics. And, Absolutely. and from there, you, you stayed active throughout, throughout from, from 12 on. I mean, you stayed active I did. I did. more and more going through and uh, were active throughout the state uh, as you were in high school and then uh, shortly after. And then you kind of took a little bit of a sidebar from politics, kind of go work and actually try to make some money and start a career, right? I did. There's something about making money. It kind of helps you pay the bills. But, uh, you know, it's hard to leave what you love to do. And if you can make money and do what you love, that's always a great combo. I Absolutely. actually, when I was uh, back in 2008, I was working 
and uh, was actually getting paid to, to work an actual job, I say, but politics is an actual job, I think, too. <laughs> right. um, On but some days. I was uh, working a day job, and uh, there was a guy by the name of Fred Thompson who was running for president, and it was the Iowa caucus coming up in 2008. And I loved watching his videos, and I was keeping up with everybody in the race back in the uh, Republican primary back then. And I, I spent most of my savings in the bank to buy a ticket and donate money and go and work for about a month or so on his race in Des Moines, Iowa, and then traveled around the state of Iowa and did some work there for his candidacy for president. And that was kind of my first big thing I'd ever done politically, aside from volunteering locally in my town. Well, um, you worked so for him for a, a month, so that means you worked for pretty much the entire campaign, right? <laughs> no, okay, yeah, very funny. Okay, you know what? We no, I, I was a Fred head, so I'm, I'm with you 100%. I, that was one of those no, races. No, it, it was... It was unfortunate that he did not have the excitement that I think most yeah. of the people who did who were working for him and with him and that. But uh, but we were, man, we were hard. If we had been uh, the candidate, I think we would have done a lot better. No, no offense. Doubt. Uh, may he rest in peace. I'm, a, I'm still a big fan of Fred. Um, but anyway, after that, I went down to make money. I moved down to Texas, a state I thought I would never live in, but I had a, got a job offer. I came down to San Antonio area, started working and making money. But I met a, a kid by the name of Luke Macias who worked for the same company I was in. And we both found we had a love for politics. And so we both were volunteering on local races, like city council races, state board of education races in Texas, anybody who was willing to listen to what we thought were good ideas politically. And we were just volunteering and helping out and doing what we could, knocking on doors for candidates and, and spreading the conservative message for these people that we thought were good people to be in office. Well, and if from that relationship, you guys started working together. Uh, obviously, Luke has gone on to be a, an incredible consultant working with Tons of candidates mm -hmm. around the state. Uh, you know, you worked with him and for him for a couple of years after you guys both That's left right. the higher education company you were working for at the time, and you so you got a lot of exposure to these these candidates, and it's kind of part of a really cool chapter in conservative history here in Texas. In that, you know, when you look back nine years ago, when Luke and you and I were getting involved in a lot of this stuff, we had a much different landscape yeah. as far as especially the state house, state senate for sure. All these different, all these, both those legislative bodies, right. the makeup was not nearly so conservative as it is now. And so we've got to, you know, oh, yeah, we, we've been part of that. You know, I, I'd like to give us a lot of credit for it, but we've been just part of a huge movement, really. <laughs> I mean, heck, we can take sure. credit for it. Uh, Micah and I. We're the only ones here. So we're the only two people on this podcast. Right. We can take credit for whatever we want. That's so, right. you know, we got to be part of a, a really cool wave and movement here in Texas that got to elect a lot of rock star conservatives, your current boss among them. That's right. And it, it's been a really neat chapter that's, you know, with this cycle with Speaker Strauss just saying he's not running again, so many uh, chairman level members not running again, yeah, we're seeing some really cool stuff happening here that, that conservatives really like. So you went from that, you, you worked with Luke for a number of years, got to help a lot of, elect a lot of rock stars. And then <sighs> when was it that you decided to go and, and to join the, uh, join the legislative staff side? The dark side, if you will, of the <laughs> yes. state. Um, well, interestingly enough, I, so Luke and I worked together for a cycle. Actually, we, we, we volunteered on a lot of different stuff and did things. I actually moved back to Kentucky for about an 11-month period um, in the winter of 2010 and was there for um, just just under a year. And the reason I did that was because uh, I just had some – I thought that was where I was supposed to be, and I moved back there. I ran for local Republican Party chairman, one. Um and tried to build the party there in a, in a very heavily Democrat area of the state. And we did a lot of door-to-door -door campaigning, and we registered, you know, actually 23, 2,600 people to be Republicans, I believe, if I'm correct, in a very heavily Democrat area. So I kind of got some party-side experience as well, which I wasn't expecting. But when I got back home to Kentucky, after being living in Texas, they were like, hey, what do you know about politics? You're, you used to be involved here. Well, you should run for county chairman. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. I don't even, what would I do? And they were like, don't worry about it. Nobody else knows either. I'm like, okay, cool. So I ran and, uh, and won and so got involved in kind of the party there as well. And then about 11 months, 10 or 11 months, uh, Luke called me up and was like, hey, man, Texas needs you. And I was like, okay. So uh, I think he just needed somebody to help him out on these campaigns, you know. Right. So I uh, moved, moved back down to Texas which is a very abbrevi abbreviated version, and, and we started working on campaigns. Again, I was working for his consulting firm, uh, Messiah Strategies. Man, well, it was good to get back from Texas. I feel like, you know, I, when you – about the time that I figured out you'd gone back to Kentucky, I looked around your back here at uh, Tarrant County events here in Texas, and I was like, dude, where'd you go? <laughs> You're back already. <laughs> yeah. That's the that's really one thing about Texas yeah. is you can't stay gone that long. So it was, uh, it was definitely good to have you back. And so after that, you know, you got you got it back into working with Luke. 
And so when was it you made the transition? Yeah, because once Tony Correct. got elected, Sorry, you was, went to work for yeah. him, right? That was your original question. I apologize. Um, we uh, So it's interesting. Uh, Tony was in our second round of candidates that I worked with Luke. So the first round we did, we had three or four candidates who were running, and then we built on that. We had a couple of more in that cycle. And then we won a bunch of races. And then trans, you know, or to, uh, fast forward a little bit to the next election cycle two years later, and we had a bunch more people who were like, hey, you guys are conservative and you ran races. And one of those people we ran into was a guy by the name of Tony Tenderholt, who's my current boss. And we had heard about him because he stood up at the local Republican chapter, Republican club chapter in Arlington, where uh, the district is. And he, nobody knew who he was really uh, at that meeting. And he said, hey, I'm running against the lady sitting right here in front because she's a liberal Republican. And everybody's like, what the heck? <laughs> who is this guy? We love this. And me and Luke, we heard about this guy. And we were like yeah, this guy's cool, you know, like he's got some, he's got some uh, hardware, like he's ready to go. So we, uh, we got in touch with him and, uh, I was like, Luke, we've got so many clients. He's like, let's just talk to him. He wound up signing on, we wound up working with him and he became one of my guys that I worked with, uh, with Luke. And so Tony and I became very close and I would go up and help block walk and work with him on the campaign. So when things were kind of winding down, I really just felt like a transition was in order. I really wanted to go and have some experience stateside, you know, working in the legislature. And uh, Tony, I was helping him look for a chief of staff. And one day he was like, hey, uh, we were actually, we were at Connie Burton, Senator Burton's uh, victory party, the second one uh, of her first race and uh, her runoff. And he was like, hey, I just want you to be my chief of staff. I was like, you know, yeah. I'm like, well, I want to be your chief of staff. He's like, oh my gosh. And so we shook hands and that was it. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, as much fun as I, I make towards the staffer side, folks, you know, elections are really a necessary evil, right? Because, yes. you know, especially for you and I, we care about policy outcomes. And that comes when people mm -hmm. get bills signed, to get bills passed. And so everything we do on the consulting side that I do on the coaching side, it all is for the purpose of getting good people elected who can cast those votes to make the changes, to push the bills forward mm -hmm. and, and the policies that are going to make our country freer and allow us to, to do what we should and what we want to do. And so I, I really, I have a lot of respect for the folks who have the, the ability to stick true to principle over on the staff side, because that's frankly much more difficult than it is to, to go and, and do things on the, on the campaign side. Because we get to pick some great people. We get to go do a lot of work, hopefully make mm -hmm. enough money to pay the bills. And we, we get to, you know, be, have the moral, you know, be, be proud of ourselves for work backing good people. You guys get the really hard work of actually going and trying to craft these bills, find the points of order, get everything done to actually pass <laughs> these policies. So I, I appreciate the fact you're willing to do that. I have uh, thought about quitting many times <laughs> in the same day, even, you know, uh, I remember uh, one time in particular, and Tony will probably remember this as well if he ever makes it on this show. Uh, he, uh, I had called him on the floor, and there was supposed to be a coalition of guys who were coming together to fight this bill, which was a bad bill, which is not unusual. That happens every day when we finally get to, you know, passing bills. And, and he goes, hey, we're going to kill this thing. I was like, okay, and we had the plan in place. And then he calls me back a few minutes later, and he goes, hey, man, everybody crapped out on us. And I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, well, they all just, they all just kind of walked away. Nobody wanted to do it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, I only got like two of us here. We're going to go do it. But man, it's hard to get people to want to fight down here on the floor of the house. And this was, this was two sessions ago, you know, during the 84th. Right. And so it's probably him and Jonathan I mean, Stickland sitting, at, sitting back there at the back mic. Actually it was. So Jonathan told me something the other day, we, the three of us were sitting up at the Capitol and uh, in the office and Jonathan goes, dude, Tony Tenderholt will come up to me and he'll say, Hey, Jonathan, just back me up. I got an idea. And Jonathan's like, I got no clue what he's going to do. But I just go up there. I'm like, I'm with you, man. Let's do this. Let's fight. Because he says, I know where Tony's principles lie. And I know he believes right. in the cause of liberty. So I know what he, I know I can support him because I know we fought before. We know mm -hmm. it. And he's going to get up there. And sure enough, we're fighting for the same issue. And I'm like, yeah, man, let's do this. And so we've built that in the house side of things, but it's not been easy. And it's, it's never, you know, never easy to do something that's really worth doing in government. And I'm sure that applies to other principles in life, but government's hard to get good things accomplished in, you know? Well, um, and when you have so many different people of so many different backgrounds, it, it really becomes incredibly important that you do have that core character, that you have the integrity yes. and that people know where you stand because, you know, people, you know, whether you're conservative or liberal, a lot of people, you're going to get criticized for your politics and where you stand on policy. But what I've found, and you, I think, can speak to this better than I can, is that you know, within the House, within any legislative body, there's a great deal of respect, even if someone disagrees with you, if they know where you stand. And if you, they believe that you're someone that actually believes this stuff, it's not just that you're running with the talking point because you think it's popular or it help you get the next rung on the ladder. It's because yeah. you actually believe it. 
and they mm-hmm. can disagree with you and they can fight to beat you on the floor in your election wherever else but there's a level of respect you get for being honest for having integrity and actually believing in the things you say absolutely and i think there are, there are certain staffers uh, and, and this is not to slight any staffer. There, there are Democrat staffers who I respect more than than some Republican staffers I know. And I don't say that to be mean to anybody. I just no. say that there are people who are principled in what they believe who work for things that I don't agree with. But we both have our principles that we're going to stick to. And so I respect that in, in, in a lot of ways. But then there are those people who, frankly, don't work for anybody. And, and I mm-hmm. think there are those some staffers who just who won't do that. They only work for people who really align with the principles they believe are what's best for Texas. And those are the people who I have great respect for. And I feel like you can almost you can work with those people because you know that, you know what, they're not just going to go out there and do whatever it takes. They're going to do what's right regardless what they believe is right, regardless of what that consequence is. And I respect that more than I do somebody who's like, well, let's do it this one time because I think it'll work. No, 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 no. It's either it's right to do or it's wrong to do. You know, you can't always just you can't fudge the lines just because you want to get it done. So I want to come back to the chief of staff stuff because there's a lot that we okay. can uncover there. But let's let's take a step back to the campaign side and some of those lessons you learned there, both apparently as a candidate and uh, and through your work volunteering <laughs> wow. and and supporting them for the consulting side. So you know, when you're looking at campaigns, uh, you know you and Luke, you know myself as well, you know, we have very uh, very strict rules for ourselves as far as who we work with. And we mm-hmm. care because, once again, it comes back to those policy outcomes. We don't want to help elect somebody who's not going to further the constructive policy outcomes that we want to see and we believe are going to help our state and our country. So, you know, when you guys are looking at candidates, what were some of the real markers you look for, both as far as, you know, finding people that were going to stick to principle as well as finding people who could win? Sure. Well, a lot of times, well, I say a lot of times, there were, there were several times in particular I can think of that candidates would contact, you know, Luke or us and say, hey, we'd love to meet and, and we'd love for you to take care of our campaign, et cetera. And we would always, Luke would sometimes go by himself and there were many times we went together and we'd have dinner with them. And if they were married, we'd, we'd always say, hey, we'd love to meet your wife because we want to meet the family. You know, you want to see what does the family think about this candidate too, right. you know, or, or the husband as the case may be. And so we would, we would go and we would sit down. I know Luke would ask several questions and I would ask some questions. I did a lot of listening. Um, but you know, it was more of, Hey, what do you, where are you guys at? Like, where are you at in your marriage? Where are you at in life? You know, what do you not so much? Hey, what do you think about abortion? What do you think about taxes? What do you think about these issues? At first, it was just, who are you? What do you do? What's mm-hmm. your business look like? You know, well, what do you believe? You know, Oh, we go to, we go to this Methodist church over here and we have these friends. Oh, okay, cool. So what's your faith mean to you? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, you know, who are your friends and how well do they know you? What would they say if I went and talked to you? you know, if I went and talked to them about you. And so it was a lot of those relational things that you look for. What are the foundations? Cause sometimes you can learn so much about people right there. You know, you find yes. out what makes them tick and then it's, well, Hey, what do you believe about politics? And a lot of times they're like, Hey, I don't know anything about politics. And we're like, sweet. That's great. Now, what do you believe about, you know, the life of the unborn. What do you believe about, you know, uh, illegal immigration? What are your thoughts on that? And then hearing where they're at on those positions, those are extremely important as well. But it covers such a wide swath instead of just, you know, well, hey, you want to run? Sweet. You got some money? Cool. Well, we can do this. No, it's more of, and <laughs> which, which honestly, I mean, that's the money the typical question was one of the convers- last ones. Yeah. I mean, that's the typical conversation with, yeah. with a lot of consultants out there, not everybody, but there are plenty of consultants that you know, if you've got name ID, if you've got some money, and if you want to side with them, then cool. That that's really as far as a we conversation can make this to happen. Go. Yeah, yeah. Could you write me a check? Cool. I could probably get you into office. No, no, no. no. <laughs> it's got to be something a little more. It's got to be something a little more deep than that. Who are these? So the principles you look for are the things. You know, their faith, their family. What what does their family think about them? We all. Luke would always look at the wife and say, Hey, do you want him to run? Straight up. I mean, just tell me. What do you think? Where are you at? You know, you want to know what these people are thinking and not just. Well, hey, I want to be in office. Okay, that's nice, but yeah, there's so many questions that go into whether or not you should run, and then if you can win. And you know, we've yeah. actually got a, a we have got a free course at mycampaigncoach.com. It's like, are you prepared to run for office? And that question comes in two parts: like, you know, should you run, and can you win? Is really what you know, how I break it down. And from yeah. there, you there's about thirty or so questions that we that we ask, and I've got a you know video tutorial kind of walk through framing the questions and talking about how to answer them. Helping try to walk people through is like, wait, is this a good idea? And and one of the things I emphasize, you know, Luke and I for a long time had said, look, if the spouse is on a board, I'm not going to be working on this campaign because I mean, That's I believe right. that marriage is a covenant, that God's part of that relationship. I'm not going to, and I know that a, a campaign, if both people are not on a board, can do a lot to undermine a relationship, and I'm just not going to be part of that. So 
you know, one of the things that I always emphasize for folks is, look, you need to make it easy for your spouse to say no, mm -hmm. don't run. Because so a lot of things, a lot of people, they, you know, you ask them, you know, are, is your spouse in board? That, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I asked her if I could run, if she support me, and she said yes. I was like, okay, well, that was a terrible way to ask that question. You ask your spouse <laughs> if she supports you. Yeah. What spouse right. is going to say no? Because that just ma makes them feel like a jackass. So you sure. need to make it, ask it in such a way that it's easy for them to say no. And that means t letting them know what this actually means. Frame the question by saying, look, here are all the things people are going to say about me. Here's the amount of time that I've spent away from our family. Like, let them know actually what this could be like for them so that if they say yes, you know that you have their support. And if they say right. no, and is this something you want to invest in? You right. know, is my husband or my wife, is this something you feel like you can give your life to? Because it's not just my life, it's our life we're giving this to. It, it really is. Because, I mean, it's, it's a marriage, you're together. This is not, you know, you, your life is not your own at that point. It should it's, be, it's yeah, important exactly. That you, that you do this as a partnership. And that's whether your wife is somebody that's up there on stage with you or giving speeches or whether she's somebody that never mm -hmm. actually steps out on the campaign trail. And because there's a lot of ways to support as a spouse, whether it's the husband or the wife or what their role is on the campaign trail, that's secondary to do they actually support you? Are they all in? And and always for me, that's it has to be there. And I'll tell you, yes. another thing I'll mention that has always really impressed me about both Luke and the way you guys work together and, and the vetting that you guys put the candidates through there was a there was a county commissioner candidate that back in the day when I was when I was doing a lot of my my uh, nonprofit work I couldn't consult with candidates so I basically just would tell people hey well if you're talking to somebody Luke's your guy call him and Micah and so this guy called up Luke and they met and everything and and Luke called me back a couple days later said hey man just want you to know I'm sorry but I, I can't work with this guy and I was like okay well fair enough you know, why and he's like well he's not pro life and it had never occurred to me to ask a, a county commissioner candidate. Are you pro-life? But yeah. for Luke, that was a that was a very that was a very basic question, right? He's like, look, that's you know, right. City councilmen and county commissioners they run for state rep or Congress or county judge, and you know it doesn't matter that they're not in a position right now to have a say as far as re legislation relating to abortion or life. Um, they might someday, and I might be helping them get closer to that opportunity. And so, if we don't agree on some of these fundamental issues, then I'm sorry, but I can't help you. And that was that's right. You're, you're helping to either support life or or not support life, no matter what right. level. Yeah, exactly. And so you know, that was one of those things that that really impressed me, because I you know, I felt like I had a pretty good vetting profile for for candidates, but yet I had never thought to ask that question of a of a county commissioner. And right. that's that's one of those, you know lessons that stuck with me a lot. And you know. Right, you know, to this day, if if Luke says, "Yeah, this this is a good person," I really don't have to ask follow up questions. <laughs> <'Cause his laughs> You're like, "Well, they must be on all these issues." Exactly, because he, yeah. he does such <laughs> a good job, you know, working through the issues and doing that vetting process. That once you've passed the, the Luke Messias, you know, test, I, I'm pretty good that I can, in good conscience, work with you, uh, because he's he's proven <laughs> himself to be yeah. very true to that. So, you know, moving forward with that, so you got these basic questions. You got to figure out if you agree with them on major issues. You got to figure out their spouses on board and kind of where they're coming from and get to know the candidate. And then from there, you kind of get to the can you win side. So when you're looking at that part and analyzing your race, what are some of the big hallmarks you look for in a candidate who can win? Well, and so I'm going to say something that may sound a little a little bit of a hit on, on, on certain candidates, uh, nobody in particular, but just people who think this way. I'm a big believer in that. If you're a Christian and you're you have a relationship with the Lord, you should be talking with him and he should be guiding your life. And, you know, when you say, hey, I feel like God wants me to run. I respect that. I think that's a great thing. But a lot of times candidates be like, hey, I feel like God wants me to run for this. I'm like, OK, well, that's a great thing to say. But let's take it and let's actually go. I mean, there is the whole thing of will this glorify God? Will this honor him? Because if you're just running for yourself and you say God wants me to run, that's a whole different story from just, you know, God's actually been working in your life and is impressed on your heart right. to run for something. You know what I mean? It, there's a big difference. And so when you're looking at somebody, you know, I've seen guys who are like, oh, I want to run for Congress. I'm like, you've never run for anything. And there are two big names right now that are good people. Well, I feel like God wants me to run. OK, that's great. Why can you not support a really good guy who's already in the race? You know, so it's those kinds of things you look for. Is this somebody who's out for their own glory and their own, you know, uh, namesake? Or is it somebody who says, look, I believe in these principles and I feel like this is something that I've been called to do. And then you kind of work through that together. You look for that in them. You, you look for the principles that guide them, obviously, which gets you to that point. So it's always interesting to talk to candidates about that and get their perspective on that, because that's a term that gets thrown around a lot yes. in politics and people who are running for office. You know, well, God said run for office. Okay, well, 
But, you know, I, did your wife hear him say that? Because both <laughs> of you need to know that, you know, yeah. we need to see who's listening and who's hearing what here, because that's a very high calling when you say God has told you to do something, you know? Well, and, and I, I'm with you. As a Christian, I believe that, you, you know, that you, know, you need to be listening to what God has to say about your life and your direction. But I also am always, I find myself very dubious anytime anybody tells me that's the first reason out of their mouth as far as why they're going to run. And I, I do ask those follow-up questions. Like, oh, so, so why do you think that? Uh, is your spouse feeling the same way? Because, you know, if the, the wonderful thing about how God operates, you know, as far as my belief as a Christian, is that uh, God really speaks to us a lot of times through our spouses, through our other relationships. And I, I know for sure that God's not going to do something that's going to help tear apart my marriage. So this is a big right. friction point there. If my spouse is saying <laughs> yeah, it's a really, exactly. really bad idea, okay, then that's not God talking to me. And I think as a Christian, we understand that sometimes you know it's easy for us to hear things that might seem at a firm moment like it's it's God's direction that's not there. And so I'll look and sure. say, okay, so you say well, God's I, calling you to run. That's cool. That's great. Let's dig in a little deeper. Let's see. Okay, so let's look for signs that God's been preparing you for this, that your life has been leading in a direction where you might actually be able to win, or that right. there's some other purpose to be served here. But I, you know, I really want to hear some actual, I want to hear that they actually dig and dug deeper than that, that if they, if they actually heard God's call and they're responding to that by running, then okay, that you should have been doing some certain things. You should have been doing a little bit of research. You've been talking to people. Uh, you should have been acting in a certain way. Uh, hopefully when I start asking your friends, and this goes for people that feel God's calling it or not, you know, when I start asking your friends, okay, so Mike is running for office. He's running for state rep. Uh, there's, there's two ways they could really respond to that. One is to say, Oh heck yeah, Mike is awesome. I, I'm all I'm all in. Of course he's running. He's a great guy for that. And the other one is they can look at me and kind of cock their head and be like, "Really, Micah? He's running for what?" <laughs> exactly. And, and that's you know that tells you a whole lot. If if they can't even conceive of the possibility that that's a right. serious people's thing, people's responses idea. about their friends. Yeah, people's responses about their friends or people they know running will tell you a lot about the candidate themselves. Yes, uh, which I've seen a ton of times. And, and another thing, Raz, is interesting is when you talk to the candidate who said you know, has, you know, God called me to run. I always found it interesting to ask them, and, and this is getting into not too much, you know, deep theology, but you know, well, God called you to run, but do you believe that he's called you to win? Because we're going to, we're going to run this race. You, if you think you're going to win and you're just like going to step away from the campaign, that's not good. Cause you're going to have to work your tail end off. You're going to have to, you're going to have to give everything you've got. Mm -hmm. You got to invest personally. You got to maybe put some of your own money in. You got to walk, you got to talk, you got to take your family places. Like, are you willing to do all that stuff? Because it's not a gimme. God may have called you to something, but you got to work for it. He expects you to work for it. So it's you want to make sure that the candidate, even though they they may feel this is what they are supposed to do and this is their calling in life, that's great. But you also got to put in the hard work that's going to keep you up all hours of the night, and you're going to miss you know kids softball games and stuff like that occasionally, and you're going to have to be willing to do that so you can get there. Are you willing to do that? So let's take a little bit deeper into that. So you know, what are some of the things that you've expected out of candidates you're working with as far as workload, activities, you know, what types of things do you expect of these guys do, do you see that it took to win? Well, I think you have to set realistic goals. And so when you, especially in the initial conversations you have with a candidate, you don't say, hey, I expect you to walk a thousand doors a week. No, that's, that's ridiculous, right? I mean, we both know that's, you know, you talk to them, you say, hey, tell me about your family. Do you go to a lot of baseball games for your kids, soccer games? You know, do you and your wife have date nights? You know, what is it you guys do? Okay, so you're going to be busy with those things. So you need to tell me what level you're willing to put in. Can you walk 300 doors a week? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, let's set that as a benchmark. You're going to walk 300 doors a week for the next you know, X amount of months or weeks before the election. Okay, now I'm telling you, if you want to win, you're going to have to talk to this many people. And you're gonna, you, know, you kind of lay out what needs to happen. And then you look at what they can do. And you kind of set realistic goals. Because you don't want them to have unrealistic goals that they can't meet and then they fail and they feel like they're not going to get anything done or not accomplish anything. Right. So, Hey, I'm, I'm not against a candidate, you know, going to Sunday night service with his family or going to a softball or soccer game for his kid on a Friday night. Cause it says he has to, if, if a client called me and said, Hey, my son is graduating, I'm going to be there. I'm not going to be like, go get out and walk <laughs> 20 more doors. That could, that's 50 doors. You could have hit, you know what? You're going to have your son forever. If you really believe that's what you're supposed to do, then go. But I do want to know, are you going to get up early the next morning and go knock on 50 doors? You know what I mean? Right. Like, wh where's the level? So you kind of have yeah. to set realistic goals and also have to see what their life consists of. Everybody's different. Every candidate is going to be different. And no two candidates can do the same thing that the other guy is going to do who gets mm -hmm. the race. Yeah, I really like to say, you know, plan out kind of their general week. Kind of what's your average week? Exactly. Like? And say, okay, so what can we, you know, what are you willing to sacrifice on a regular basis? And where can we cut things out? Because, you know, 
they obviously spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week already on something. So we're going to sacrifice something in order to cut, you know, cut in campaign time. So let's say, okay, so what can we easily cut? And then what can we cut that's a little bit harder? And, you know, there are candidates that went on 10 hours a week. There are ones that went on 100 hours a week. You know, each race is different. You know, more candidate activity is generally better uh, for most candidates. But, sure. uh, you know, we, we got to set some realistic goals here because, you know, I, I found a lot of candidates, they start out by like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit my full-time job and I'm going to put 60 hours a week into this thing. Right. I'm like, okay, well, you know, what's your family budget look like, like, like? What's your emergency fund look like? Is this realistic? Is your wife going to be okay with the fact that your financial security is being <laughs> exactly? How's that not everybody can life? take a sabbatical. Yeah, no. not everybody can take a sabbatical. Some people, Some people can. can, and that's, that's great. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. But you know, it's like let let's set a, a kind of inside outside goals here. For it's like I know that I can give at least twenty hours a week to campaign activities. Okay, cool. Well, then let's break down how we're going to spend that to talk to the most people, voters and donors. Like, what are you going to be right. doing there? What's our battle plan? And then outside that, we say, okay, well, we still know that we got to talk to X number of thousand more people than you're going to be able to personally touch. So, you know, how are we going to do through volunteers, through raising money and paying staff? You know, it, it allows us to really build out the rest of the campaign plan from there once we know the candidate's level activity. And if the candidate, you know, really lies to themselves and to you by saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to be full time or this, I can do twice what I'm, it was actually realistic, yeah, I mean, you know, that yeah. doesn't do anybody any help. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Raz, you brought up something else. Raising money is another thing, which you may go there. But one of the things I'm thinking of is when I talk, when we talk to clients, when I work with Luke and when I've ever talked to people I've, who I'm going to work with, either as a campaign manager, I want to know that they're willing to go out and ask for money. Yes. Because a lot of times you'll talk with a client and they'll go, hey, look, how much money do we need to win this race? And you say, okay, you know, let's, you, know you need $100,000. Oh, I can't raise that. Okay, well, how many friends do you have? Oh, I mean, you know, we got like 20 or 30 people we hang out mm -hmm. with. Okay, how many people do you know? We know like 50 or 60. Okay, cool. Can you ask every one of them for a hundred dollars? No. Can you ask fifty of them for hundred? Yes. Okay. Well, then ask those people for that. Okay. Three weeks goes by. Who have you talked to? Who have you asked money from? <laughs> well, I called you know a friend of mine and I called my brother. What they say? They said they could both give twenty. Okay. So we just raised forty dollars. Okay. Who have you called? Like, why are you not calling people? If you want <laughs> them right. to be able to raise the money, because nobody wants to give to somebody I don't think who's not willing to ask. No. And that's an awkward concept, but and and. I don't know very many conservative candidates who are good at asking for money. Uh, I say I mean, conservative because those are really the only like ones it. I've worked with. Yeah, you know, exactly. They don't. You know, it's not something yeah. that most of these guys have experience with. They're they're used to working hard for their money. They're used to right. you know, sacrifice for the family, all these things. But they're not used to asking for money. That's not a typical activity they have a lot of experience with. And, you know, I'll tell you, I mean, and you know the same thing. You've asked for money before. You've helped raise money. It's not a fun thing. I mean, there's, no. it's, it's not enjoyable for me. But it's necessary, and mm -hmm. you know, really, the way I encourage people to, to view it as, as Kansas is say, look, one, you got to know if you don't do it, you're not going to win. You're going to have to raise some amount of money, uh, and two, this is not asking for money to go for a down payment on a new beach house or some new toys or a new set of golf clubs. This is you're asking for investment in an opportunity to support these principles that you share with the with the donor, and so whether it's twenty five dollars right. or twenty five thousand, you need to make clear that you're out there to fight for this and that they're providing necessary ammunition to go out there on the battle line and fight. And that without that, that you're gonna be less prepared and less able to, to get the job done. With that, you're gonna be able to carry the banner a lot further down the field. So exactly. you know, this, is, this is a way you gotta frame in your mind. And there's a, yeah, it's not just walking up to somebody and saying, Hey, I need a hundred bucks for my campaign. I mean, yeah. you want a relationship. You say, Hey, first, that's why you ask your friends first and you ask your, your acquaintances and maybe your, your, church friends and people that you know that know you and then you can move out to other people but you don't say hey i need a hundred bucks you say hey do you believe that a baby should be protected from from conception all the way to natural death yes okay well i'm your guy you want to give a hundred dollars right. to that cause absolutely okay give me that and i'm gonna go up there and fight for it whoa sweet i mean that's a very short speech but that's the idea of what you're trying to communicate mm -hmm. to them is i have your values you can't go up there and fight all the time i will right and being able to carry that banner, be able to let them know there's somebody that's willing to go fight for these things is, is huge. And I'll tell you, I had a, uh, you know, th there's generally two categories I've seen that candidates fall into when you start talking about raising money, or as far as the most often. And th there are a couple that are like, yeah, I'll work for it, I'll raise the money, and those are awesome to find. Mm -hmm. But a whole lot of them either assume it's going to be really, really easy because they feel like they're just that compelling and that much of a rock star, or the ones who are like, no, no, <laughs> I'm just going to finance this personally. And both of those drive me nuts because 
they both lose a major point about the value of fundraising. Uh, for the folks who think it's some easy, they've clearly never raised money, and they have a. <laughs> it lets me know that we've really, really had a lot of learning curve to cover here. They soon find out, though. They uh -huh. soon find out it's not as easy as they yes. think. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the ones that think they can personally finance it, I'm like, look, you know, it's great if you can write a check for the full budget that I would love to spend in your campaign. That's awesome. But I, you still need to get there and ask for money because you need people mm -hmm. who are investors who are going to back you. And there's three things they can do for your campaign. They can endorse, they can volunteer, they can donate. That's great. Those are the three things above voting that you need people to do for you. And the, right. the, the, vote, the voting with their dollars by helping support you is a huge one. And so I, I, had, a, I had a guy that I did some coaching with, uh, Luke was his consultant last cycle, and we both beat up on this guy all cycle long saying, dude, you got to raise money. And he was self-financing, and he was able to put in a pretty significant amount of money mm -hmm. uh, in this congressional race. And did a good job, but he would not. He would not have asked for money if he put a gun to his head. And we we worked all cycle long. <laughs> you gotta yeah. raise money. Gotta raise money. Gotta call for dollars. And he just would not do it. And he just had a mental block. Couldn't get over it. And he lost. I think I think he had a chance at winning if he would raise money. But um, that ship has sailed. But he called me this summer and he said, "Hey Raz, I'm. Uh, I just want to show I'm running again." And I said, "That is awesome. You'd be a rock star in Congress. What did you learn last time that?" Will is going to help you win and do better this time. It's like, Raz, if it breathes, I'm asking it for money. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> Jack, yes, that's it. There that's you what you got to yeah. have. And so, th you know, thankfully he learned that key lesson because so many other things he did, he was a rock star at. But now that yeah. he's going to raise some money, he's working that angle really hard. That's going to round out his his game as a candidate, and he's going to be a much sure. more formidable opponent to the incumbent. Absolutely. And you know this as well. When, when you talk to somebody, you'll talk to a client and they'll, they'll be like, hey, I went and met with this guy. And, you know, he lives in my district. He owns, you know, two car lots and, and an animal hospital. And he's a good friend of mine. And, man, we just hit it off. We had coffee. And I think we're going to go out and grab dinner one night next week. Me and, the, he and his wife and my wife. OK, great. Hey, uh, quick question. Did you ask him for money? <laughs> uh, no, you know, I didn't. Why not? I mean, I didn't. I thought about it. OK. You know, it's like that. And so you have to keep drilling it into them because so often for somebody who has those principles, their last resort is to say, hey, can I have your money? They're like, no, nah, I'm going to do this. Right. But you got to ask for money. You got to. And you, people are going to tell you no. Some will say yes. And that's fine. But you, you got to ask because if you don't have at least some, you're not going to be able to pay for the palm cards, for the software, for the campaign staff. Yeah, and the gas to drive the car. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just not going to happen. And, you know, and, and one of the things that you and I have learned from the, the race that we've won, you know, we've beat people with the 10 to 1 or a 21 money advantage, mm -hmm. right? You can do that. But you still had to have something in the bank account, right? <laughs> you had to have yeah. something. Yeah, I, yeah. No, I love those people who, when you're interviewing them, they're like, hey, so – what client have you had who won with the least amount of money? I'm like, no, nah, we're not talking about that because that was a very special case. And it doesn't always happen, but they did have money. We're like, well, we could do it for a lot less. We might, but I tell you what, it's a more surefire thing and we can do things that we need to get done if we have the money. So if we can get it, let's go for it. It's not like we can't ask and we can't go out there and seek it out. Yeah, and, and worst case, you raised a bunch of money. You only have to spend a fraction of it, and now you're got a bigger war chest to save you from Sweet. getting beat next time. Yeah. That's awesome. Either way, you're gonna you're gonna need it at some point. So go ahead and ask. Absolutely. Me. All right. Yeah. So I feel like we beat this dead horse. We got the listeners nice and tired of hearing us talk about yeah, it's gone. <laughs> about fundraising and beating up on them for how they got to ask for money. So let's move on to your role as chief of staff. One of the biggest things that I'm a believer in is when it comes to being a politician, to elected official personnel is policy and the people mm -hmm. you hire to staff your office that's one of the clearest signals as a newly elected official as to whether you're going to stay true to the principles and the promises you made on the campaign trail um, one of our mutual good friends chip roy is he just announced today he's running for congress he was my right. boss in senator cruz's office and when uh, you know after senator cruz elected i was heavily involved in helping uh, from the outside of getting him elected to the senate here in texas and you know, they were talking to me about coming on as a staffer to be his, one of his regional directors when he was elected in 2012. And I waited to actually put in my resume and say that, yes, I would love that job until I found out who was me, the chief of staff, which was Chip Roy. And the reason for that was that even as much as I believed in Ted and, and loved him, I wanted to see what that first signal would be. And when I heard it was me, Chip, I was like, okay, I'm all in because I've known him for years. He's a rock star. And so that was a clear sign to the conservatives around the state that Ted was going to be the guy that he campaigned as. And that's the kind of guy that I wanted to work with and work for. 
And for somebody like Tony bringing you on, you know, that was a clear signal that, hey, I campaign as a conservative. I'm going to legislate as one too. And I want a good team around me that's going to fight hard, that's going to hold me accountable, and that's going to make sure that this district is well represented. So it, it, I think it's just so critically important because there's a mm. lot of pressure around you know when you're hiring these staff to hire people that have been there for 20 years who bounce around between different offices and and don't get me wrong there are you know many of them who you know who are great they're conservative they've been the, been in the state house for a long time as professional staff that said i really think that who you hire matters and yes. you know tony sent a clear signal as he was hiring you and the other folks that populated his office that he was going to be the person he campaigned as so talk a little to me about as you know, from from your perspective as a staffer, the importance right. of hiring the right people and, and really what they do, why that matters. Sure. Well, you know, when a when, whether a state representative, a state senator in the state of Texas, or a U.S. congressman or senator, doesn't matter. Whoever it is who comes into office, the first thing you've got to have is trust. You know, and you've got to establish trust in your office because what goes in and out of your office will determine how you perform as a representative. You know, in, in any capacity. So the people mm-hmm. who come in and listen and talk to your staff. And the things that are said that come out of your office are going to really impact your effectiveness and what people think about you. So you got to have trust. And so when Tony and I, you know, when Tony got elected and he said, hey, I was like, hey, I want to be your chief. He's like, I want you to be my chief. We shook hands. We started talking about what is our what does our office look like? What kind of atmosphere do we want to have? And I think every chief of staff or every person who's going to be the number two or the behind the scenes person who's making sure everything happens for the person they're working for needs to make sure it needs to establish that trust with their boss because, and it's going to look different. Everybody's relationship with their staff is going to look different, but you have to trust. And a lot of times I see representatives or people who are elected to public office and the people who they work for, I get the feeling they don't trust them so much because when I go in there, they're always, they're micromanaging, they're, they're, they're all over the place. And they're like, Oh, I don't know if we did the right thing. And it's like, Hey, if you have a good staff and you trust them, they're going to do the right thing. Doesn't mean they're not going to mess up. Doesn't mean they're not going to have to come ask forgiveness. They're not going to have to fix something, but you know what? If you trust them, that is so much more than having people who just dot every I and every T and get it right. Okay, so that's that's like the first thing you have to have is trust in your office when you're hiring people and you're having a relationship. And for me and Tony, when we started hiring people, he said, hey, I don't really know a ton of people. You're going to have to help me out. So I went to people like you and other people in the state and talked about and found people who we have mutual friendships with or knowledge of and said, hey, you want to come work with us? Let's talk. And so we would have conversations. We would find out more than just, hey, they worked on this campaign for this conservative candidate, you know, which is great, by the way. But, you know, what do they believe and how do they grow up? Where are they from? You build a relationship. That way, when you bring them in, you know a little bit more about them and you get to know each other. You're going to spend a lot of time together. You're going to spend a oh, lot yeah. of time with your staff, sometimes 24-7 almost, because, you know, there's 2, 3 a.m., 4 a.m. mornings in the office occasionally where you're working and you're reading bills and getting everything prepared for the boss for the next day. So you want to make sure that you trust and you know more about them than just, well, they vote Republican or they right. vote Democrat. Whoever you are, whoever's office you're in, you better make sure you know more about them than that, what their party affiliation is. Because then you build trust, and I think trust is the most important thing in the office. When I was looking for people, um, I tried to find people that somebody else I knew either had a relationship with as a friend or they worked for somebody who was conservative, people who could speak well of their character and you know their principles. And that, that's the most important thing to me. We can, you can learn how to file something. You, know? you can learn how to get a file folder and put paper in it and put it in the file. Okay, great. What you want is somebody who has quality character. You know? Well, and you had to take a whole new level of management experience when you took on your chief of staff role, right? Because, I mean, you had managed people ostensibly through your other work and through helping you know, run these campaigns as a consultant. But this is a whole new thing for you. So, like, how did mm-hmm. you, how did you adjust the chief of staff role and really learn how to be a manager to actually run an office? It is like drinking from a fire hose when you become a chief of staff. And a lot of people are like, "Oh, that's a cushy job. That's awesome. You're, you know, well, okay, that's great." But when you walk into the office and you've got a week before session begins, and you know, you don't know where the bathrooms are, or, you know, you don't know, you know, where uh, the, the clerk's office is for your particular committee that, you know, you wind up getting in about a month or so. Those things matter. And you have to know those things as well as you have to learn how to lead people and how to channel people's strengths. Mm-hmm. And that was something Tony, I, I can say not to, not to uh, try to get on his good side. I hope I don't have to, but um, you know, something he taught me uh, very well was that when it comes to people, you have to learn how to listen and how to channel their strengths, find out what their strengths are and point them in the right direction. Right. So that was one of the things I tried to do. 
uh, along with some John Maxwell books that my dad kept drilling into me. It's like, hey, have you read this? Yes. No, I haven't read that one. You know, because there are some really good <laughs> yeah. books out there. You know, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. That was a great book that I read. It's just, man, it gives you some pointers on just how to deal with people and how to be genuine, but also be the boss at the same time. And so it's, it's learning from people who've gone there before you. And it's also drinking from that fire hose and going, okay, well, today I'm just going to do this and we're going to see how the rest of it works. That happens, you know, a lot of times. Well, and you had a boss that, that understood leadership. You know, Tony, his background in the business world as well as as a combat leader in the Army, you know, he, he knew how to lead people. And he's, he's a good yes. teacher when it comes to helping convey how to lead and, you know, organize that office from the top down. You know, it's one of those areas where when you have – uh, when the chief of staff and the member have the same weaknesses, you got a real problem. But when you have, yeah, for sure. yeah when you have some a group of people that has complementary strengths and they kind of cover each other's weaknesses, as you guys had, that was a really powerful combination. And so, you know, when mm -hmm. I'm talking to people about when you're hiring a chief of staff, when you're hiring really anybody, but especially in that kind of a leadership role, make sure that you complement each other well. That you you work Correct. well together as a fire team, you're able to complement those those strengths and weaknesses of one another to make sure that you don't have wide gaps. And so that's you know, with you not having as much leadership experience in that kind of role, his leadership experience helped kind of cover you and make sure that, that you were able to have some buffer to learn that and to embrace that role. For sure, where somebody could look out for you and, and make sure you weren't screwing up on that front. Whereas on the political front, on the policy side, you could help him as well. You could, you know, he was new to that arena. And so you were able to help make sure that he was, you know, he wasn't making mistakes. He wasn't missing something and, uh, and able right. to serve him well in that capacity. And I think a lot of times, you know, and you spoke to this a little bit, when you go to hire somebody, it's easy to just hire somebody who looks good on paper, right? right. You get a resume and you're like, man, you're qualified, but it is good. And I, you know, Tony never looked at my resume. I never gave it to him. He just knew who I was. Right. And so I think if you can't know who somebody is and hire them, you know, go to somebody who you trust immensely and say, Hey, and it doesn't even have to be somebody who's been involved in politics. One of my, one mm -hmm. of the best guys at the Capitol that I worked well with, who I think is a great, is a great guy and has been just a real a blessing to work with with me, is is uh, Chief of Staff Tim Harden, who actually was not in government before he came and worked for his boss at right. the Capitol. But he works hard and he's awesome and he figures things out and he's confident. And so, and he knew his boss and they were friends before politics, which I think is a huge thing. If you know somebody and you don't even have to be friends with them before, find somebody that other people trust who's good at leading people or who's good at talking and being involved in people's lives, bring them in and see if they work, talk it out because paper is great. Resumes are good. But at the end of the day, you got to work well together and you got to compliment each other. You got to, you got to go play on each other's weaknesses and strengths. You are absolutely right. Well, as we're kind of starting to wrap down the uh, the episode, let's let's look back. You know, you're somebody that you know our listeners, many of them are are thinking about being involved in politics as a career, as a staffer, as a campaign operative, and you obviously through your background have, have taken a pretty interesting road to get there. I feel like all the folks I know that fall in that same category, the, the roads are all different, and they're all uh, they're all kind of interesting. How in the heck they ended up where they're at? Uh, well, when you look back in time, you know what kind of piece of advice would you give yourself? You know, ten years ago, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting when I worked for, uh, Senator Cruz's runoff race in Texas, um, which I know, uh, there's a lot to be said about that and that you were involved in, in, and got to know each other there a little bit. And I worked with your brother when, when we were on the first call, they went around on the call with all the field staff and everybody's supposed to say where they got their degree, what they got it in. And one cool thing about themselves or something like that. Right. And there's, you know, a dozen people on the call plus, and so they get to me and I'm the third to the last. And everybody got their degree at Hillsdale, University of this and that, and, you know, all this different stuff. And they're like, hey, so, you know, Micah, tell us about yourself. And I said, well, I don't have a degree. I actually quit college. And uh, I, I volunteered on campaigns to get where I am today. So, you know, I don't have the paper learning, <laughs> but I do, have the, I do have the trench learning, which I think is just as important, probably more important. No offense. I said, I think degrees are awesome. And I think if you've got one, you could probably tell me a few things. But how I got to where I am, I have the same job you do but I didn't graduate. Um, so, you know, so it, to me, if I would have talked to myself back then, I would have said, Hey, listen to other people because everybody else, there's so much listening instead of talking is so important, especially when you're getting ready to do something. If you have a job you want to get, the last thing you should probably do is go tell everybody what you're going to do when you get the job. You should probably ask people what you should be and who you should be for your position. You know what I mean? Like it should be more humility goes a long way. And it's more than just saying, I'm so humbled to be here. It's actually listening. 
You know, I love those tweets when people are like, I'm honored and humbled to be given this endorsement. I'm like, okay. Um, but, but there is something to be said for listening. And so if I could look back and, and I, I would listen more, I would prepare more. My dad always told me when I was a kid, he said, Micah, everything in life is preparation, everything yes. for something else. And I would have taken that to heart a lot sooner and a little bit more, a little bit more seriously because everything that I went through was just preparation for something else. The people I met, the people I worked with, the opportunities that came my way, you know, if you don't just see them as a stepping stone to where you want to go, but also as preparation for who you're going to be as a person when you get there, wherever that may be. And you may be, I don't know, maybe digging a ditch somewhere because the economy's bad and you need money. That Whatever you did 10 years ago was preparation for that. Remember that and think about that. And I think if I had done that and the times I did do it, it helped prepare me better for who I was going to be in the future. Um, book learning is important, but listening and learning and reading, you know, there's more to learning than just going to school, you know, finding things that will actually make you a better person, literature and getting in the word. If you're a believer, that's where you should be uh, first and foremost. So that's what I would tell myself. I think those are both phenomenal pieces of advice. Now, hopefully, you know, we're, we're doing this on the, uh, on the 6th. The 11th is the filing deadline here in Texas. I don't think your boss has a challenger yet. I'm hoping that he will be without one. I'm currently knocking on wood. I tell you, Raz, and, I don't uh, believe in luck, but I've got, <laughs> I've got both fingers crossed right now and both my, both my toes crossed down here on my finger. I am, I am so holding on that we don't have a challenger. So I, we'll I'm, see. I'm very hopeful for that. We'll, we'll see come, <laughs> uh, come Monday, That's I guess. Right. But, uh, you know, and, and you'll be able to be out there, hopefully helping some good other guys get elected. But, you know, what is it about uh, you know, looking forward to the next legislative session? We'll look at, you know, a year and a bit forward. You know, what is it that has you excited about your role as chief of staff and what you're doing there in the state legislature? Well, it, there's always the opportunity when you're doing something in politics, you know, to, to look to something else. You know, you want to be the chief of staff for the next big guy who's running mm -hmm. or the campaign manager for the Congress guy who's running or what have you. But, but also it's being – it's being very excited about where you're at because of what you're doing. Because to me, it's more about what we're accomplishing. So for me, when I look forward, I want to stay with Tony Tenderholt for next session, not just because I don't want to do anything else. There are other opportunities or things you can pursue. I am excited about what's happening. Right now, we have a conservative movement like we haven't seen in Texas in, in generations, I think. Yes. Um, way before my time, you know, but back when I was running campaigns with Luke Macias and you and me and we all got to know each other. There was the, not the excitement that there is now. There was not the intensity. And we're seeing conservatives being willing to stand up. And we're also seeing people who probably are moderate at best who are becoming more conservative for some reason because it's more popular. Um, and, and I say that because I've sat in meetings with people who I know wouldn't normally vote a certain way, but they're talking about what we could do for conservative issues that they weren't talking about before. And when I hear those things and I see those things, I go, man. The 86th, it's going to be intense. It's going to be exciting. doesn't mean we don't have work to do. we got so much work to do, which is the other reason I want to be there. I want to be there to fight against those things that make Texas less conservative or, or tear us down in an economic way or in a social way. I want to be there to help fight for those things. But also, there's a movement going on, and it's really exciting to be a part of right now in the House and the Senate, the House especially. Um, and so I'm looking forward to seeing the goals we're going to set and uh, to watching my boss at the back mic again next session, no matter who the Speaker of the House is, you know, holding the people accountable who are calling the shots at a little bit higher level and saying, hey, let's make sure we do the right thing for Texas and not just what's right for us politically or for our careers. <laughs> well, I'm also excited about hearing, seeing your boss at the back mic and texting you about the <laughs> points of order or whatever crazy shenanigans he's going to pull back there. It's, you know, it's exciting to me to see people like yourself, you know, friends, people that I've known for a long time, that are doing good work, that are fighting their good fight. And and really, you know, one of the coolest things you know, we haven't got a chance to talk about today, and we'll get a chance today, but you know, one of the really cool things you've been able to do is as somebody that's a conservative, that's got some experience as chief of staff, as we've been getting so many new people in, so many new conservatives in mm -hmm. every cycle, you've played a really awesome role helping mentor a lot of these new rookie chiefs of staff and staffers that are coming in to help make sure they know how to serve the boss as well and really help keep the staff on the right path when it comes to to doing the right thing, helping their bosses stay conservative, mm. fight for the right things, and helping you know, uh, really behind the scenes role. And, and that's been, I think that's one of the coolest things that you've got to do and roles you just kind of fell into. And I really appreciate that work. So it's, it's one of those things that not many people see, but that has immense value for the movement. And when you have those types of relationships within the Capitol with, among your peers, 
uh, that bears a lot of fruit for the movement as well as your boss. So thank you for that. Well, it's my pleasure to be a part of the movement in some small way and to meet people and, and to get to come and talk to people like you and uh, to see those friendships grow. But I, I appreciate you having me on, Raz. I've, I've enjoyed chatting with you. I have a feeling we could go for two hours and, and we, <laughs> we'd least. still be going. <laughs> at least might have to uh, might have to pour some drinks to keep talking some more and with the whistle a little bit but let's well, uh you know, let's wrap it up with where people can find you online if they got questions want to bug you on twitter want to reach out to for advice where can people find you sure absolutely i mean i'm, I'm on facebook at micah cavanaugh it's just uh facebook slash i believe slash micah cavanaugh which if you can spell cavanaugh without me telling you then you know you're doing really well but c-a-v-a-n-a-u-g-h uh, on twitter you can find me at m cavanaughster that's M-C-A-V-A-N-A-U-G-H-S-T-E-R on Twitter. So I'd be happy to – I don't tweet too much, but that's just so that I stay out of trouble, you know? <laughs> Very nice. Well, in case people can't spell Kavanaugh, we will include the links to your uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram in the show notes. So if you want to connect with you on any of those or uh, laugh at all your pictures, you know, whatever, we'll, uh, we'll connect them with you there. So check out the show notes if you want to reach out to Micah. I uh, really appreciate you having, coming on today. It's been great. We expect your boss in here shortly, and we hold you responsible for the, his, uh, his timeliness in the matter. Uh, for all the listeners, thank you guys so much for downloading again. If you got thoughts on our new format, uh, let me know. Raz, R-A-Z, at mycampaigncoach.com. Uh, next week, we'll be back talking to me, uh, just kind of diving deep on some kind of campaign subject. If you got feelings on what that should be, ping me on Twitter or Facebook. You know where to find me, and we'll look forward to talking to you guys again next week. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.